I want to talk to you about five important conversations I had with my kids. As a parent, educator, and leader, I'm sure my kids grew up observing my bias toward growth and lifelong learning. Over the years, I would take them out to breakfast or lunch or we'd go on a trip and we'd talk about life and leadership. I wanted them to not only be career ready, but life ready. Here are five of the topics I discussed with them in middle school and high school. Number one, your EQ is more important than your IQ. My kids experience what most kids do today, schools that place much emphasis on testing and academics. And while we valued studying and good grades, I focused on the great differentiator, emotional intelligence. Author Daniel Goleman said, if your emotional abilities aren't in hand, if you don't have self-awareness, if you're not able to manage distressing emotions, if you can't have empathy and effective relationships, then no matter how smart you are, you're not going very far. In fact, I boiled it down this way to my kids. Success in school is 75% IQ, 25% EQ. In life, it's the reverse. 75% EQ, 25% IQ. Goldman concluded, in high IQ jo job pools, soft skills like discipline, drive, and empathy make those who emerge as outstanding. My wife and I even had a party where we had our kids host the party at 10 years old. And they learned all these EQ things in real life talking to adults. Number two, maturity demands that you get over yourself. Both of my kids aspired to come across more mature than their peers who were into childish fads or stupid social media stunts. I capitalized on this aspiration and began talking to them about what maturity looks like as early as fifth grade. I created a list called the Marks of Maturity, which I later included in my book, Artificial Maturity. In most cases, the qualities that mark a mature person are ones that illustrate the person has gotten over themselves and no longer have to be the center of attention. They overcome attention-seeking behaviors. They are humble as they see how others played a role in their success. They're able to keep long-term commitments. They're grateful for all that they enjoy. And finally, the goal of life is to avoid pain or find easier ways to live. It is to invest yourself in a cause that's bigger than you. My wife and I even took our kids to soup kitchens and shelters just to serve those who had no homes to drive this point home. Number three, growth will always require a struggle. This topic was a tough one. It's an issue I tried to teach experientially, not just verbally. The bottom line is any goal we set, any target we try to hit, any worthwhile aspiration will require a sacrifice and a struggle to reach it. When my kids saw me struggle with a big goal I set, I tried not to hide it from them. I wanted them to see me as an adult, wrestle with the emotions that come with hard work, wanting to quit, wishing someone would rescue me from the hard work or desiring someone to join me in my pity party. My son and daughter watched me work nonstop on a book project that took 13 long months in my basement office. One year, I wrote three books in addition to my normal job. I wanted them to see the value of struggle and the satisfaction that comes with doing more than what was expected. Brian Koslow once said, to increase your effectiveness, make your emotions subordinate to your commitments. Number four. Success will likely take longer than you think it will. I spoke to my kids about the apparent overnight sensations that seem to pop up on television or YouTube. I explained that 99% of the time, their success was not overnight. Americans called the Beatles an overnight success, but they held concerts for many years in Germany in obscurity. I used a habitude to explain success cooks in a crock pot, not a microwave. It takes longer, but tastes better in the end. I would tell them that they'd sabotage themselves if they could not delay gratification. I served under John C. Maxwell for 20 years and didn't start my own nonprofit, Growing Leaders, until I was 43 years old. I was in a crock pot preparing for the role that I have today. We must learn to work and to wait. This happened with both of my kids when they bought a car. I paid half and they paid half, but they had to wait months before they could afford their half. And finally, number five, the first person you must lead is yourself. Eric Michael Leventhal put it this way, 
We are most powerful the moment we no longer need to be in power. In a day that promotes leadership on the resume or transcript, I tried to teach my own kids that we have no right to lead others until we've proven we can lead ourselves. Then people can look at us and say, I want to follow you because I respect you. You've earned the right to influence me, not by position, but by discipline. In fact, I believe genuine leadership requires no badge or title at all. I ask my kids to read biographies of men and women who had no official title, but who influenced the world greatly. When we make self-leadership the goal, everything else naturally follows. And this means managing our emotions as well as our will. Mavis Maxura summarized it this way, emotions can get in the way or get you on the way. If you're a parent, we've just launched a resource called Home Chats, sparking eight conversations at home that we feel are suitable for this time period. Just go to growingleaders.com slash home chats. That's growingleaders.com slash home chats.